So good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the Center for the Study of World Religions. I know many of you have been here many times and know the place, in fact, better than I do, some of you. But I'm very happy to be here and be your host tonight. And if this is your first time visiting the Center, a special welcome to you. My name is Frank Clooney. I'm the director of the Center. And I'm happy to have my predecessor, Director John Carmen, here in the front row as well. So uh, we welcome you on behalf of the Center and its nearly 60 years of history in this uh, place. And so many events have taken place in this room over the years. So tonight, we are very excited to have the, the first annual Hindu View of Life lecture. And let me tell you a little bit about the lecture first and the donor, and then finally tonight's illustrious speaker. So our new Hindu View of Life lecture deliberately evokes the memory of Dr. Radhakrishnan's book of that title, The Hindu View of Life, which was based on the Upton lectures that he gave in 1926. And Dr. Radhakrishnan, in giving those lectures on religious experience, the conflict of religions, and Hindu dharma, two lectures on the la latter topic, were aimed at addressing constructively and for our era urgent issues um, facing the human race, facing India, but facing all of us, from a perspective informed by insights and values arising from the Hindu traditions of India and Hinduism globally. And if that was true in 1926, all the more true today. The special connection that we have with Dr. Radhakrishnan at the center in evoking the title is in part based simply on the timeliness of this theme, that we need to hear and learn from each other's views of life. We have to be able to open to one another we can't imagine to live in an environment where we think we know each other completely or where views are put to the side, but to engage and learn from every possible view, including in a very timely fashion, the Hindu view of life. But there's a special connection here is that Dr. Radhakrishnan was the opening day speaker of the center in 1960. So in November of 1960, when the center was inaugurated, uh, he was the speaker here at the center. If you go upstairs after the lecture in the um, by the offices upstairs is a signed por portrait of him, a photograph. And I believe, I think that he may have signed it the day he was here. And we also have a Shiva Nataraj on the back wall here um, with his name on it. And my speculation, I don't want to know any more facts about it, my speculation is that he gave us that when he came in 1960. And that's my story and I'm standing by it. So. <laughs> well, Professor Carmen can tell you more later if it's <laughs> another version. So a very timely way to think of him in relation to this. And underlying the lecture, echoing the history of Dr. Radhakrishnan, is the confidence that we have now in 2016 that these traditions have much to offer the wider human community on our ear, resources made evident in expert presentations and exchanges among scholars alert to the needs of the day, namely today. As is fitting to the center, as a recipient of the gift, the lecture will continue to include attention to the Hindu view of pluralism and the other religious traditions of the world. So over the years, we hope that the lecture will always be from a Hindu viewpoint, but may engage other traditions in a constructive fashion. I can't help but read. This is by no means an original copy of Dr. Radhakrishnan's book. But I'd like to read you the last paragraph. And so this is from the Upton lecture in 1926. And Again, 1926, and it's almost 100 years later, but it's still very timely. After a long winter of some centuries, we are today in one of the creative periods of Hinduism. We are beginning to look upon our ancient faith with fresh eyes. We feel that our society is in a condition of unstable equilibrium. There is much wood that is dead and disease that has to be cleared away. Leaders of Hindu thought and practice are convinced that the times require not a surrender to the, of the basic principles of Hinduism, but a restatement of them with special reference to the needs of a more complex and mobile social order. If he could say that in 26, how much more today? Such an attempt will only be the repetition of a process that has occurred a number of times in the history of Hinduism. The work of readjustment is ever in progress. Growth is slow when roots are deep, but those who light a little candle in the darkness will help to make the whole sky aflame. So I think that's a good spirit with which to think about what we do today. I would like to, uh, secondly, uh, say a word of thanks to the donor who has made this lecture possible, uh, Mr. Akhilesh Gupta, 
who is the donor, but unfortunately he's in India today and unable to be present, but he will be watching the videotape, I'm sure, as soon as it's available. But uh, Mr. Gupta came to Harvard last year in the Advanced Leadership Pro Initiative, a very prestigious program bringing business leaders and other leaders of culture from around the world to spend time at Harvard with a kind of golden key where they can take courses anywhere in the university and so on. And I was very happy to, to meet Mr. Gupta. He came and took my course at the center on the Bhagavad Gita and its commentarial tradition. And we got into conversations and he uh, kind of came forward and said, is there something we can do to enrich the life of the center and the conversations that take place here, which led to the foundation of this lecture. So Mr. Gupta uh, was originally trained in chemical engineering at IIT in New Delhi and has an MBA also from the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. He was a senior managing director and then chairman of Blackstone India. Um, in noting his gift uh, last year this time, he said, the value of the Hindu view of life is not simply because of the very ancient origins of this wisdom, but because the universal message it contains is relevant for all times and places. The lessons of Hinduism's core tenets are as relevant for the modern world, Mr. Gupta affirms, as they were in ancient times, appealing to a wide cross-section of peoples from the very scientifically oriented to those with a devotional bent of mind. And he adds, it is my privilege to support the efforts of the center in promoting interfaith dialogue too and opportunities for traditions to be learning to one another. So I'm very grateful to Mr. Gupta and I think we will keep in mind his generosity today as we proceed. So to proceed, paradoxology, the art of praising the deity. I can't think of a better person to be our first distinguished lecturer in this series. We're already thinking several years ahead to other distinguished speakers, but Dr. Vasudha Narayan is a perfect person to begin this lecture series. She is distinguished professor, Department of Religion at the University of Florida. She's also a very uh, nationally and internationally known scholar including as past president of the American Academy of Religion uh, in 2001-2. Uh, Dr. Narayanan was educated at the universities of Madras and Bombay in India, and then was here at Harvard University, in fact, here at the center, lived right upstairs. I don't know if we have a bronze plaque where you lived, but <laughs> nonetheless, lived here at the center for three years in the 1970s. The That's right, it's, um, it's, a, it's like a little museum piece now. Um, <laughs> So Vasu, uh, her fields of interest included the Hindu traditions in India, Cambodia, and America. She has taught at the University of Florida for almost four decades now, is it? Um, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> for a few years she's been in Florida. Um, and she's also very interested, as we'll see tonight, in visual and expressive cultures in the study of Hindu traditions and also issues of gender as they affect how we think about religion. She's a widely published lecturer and author author and editor of seven books at least, and many, many articles, chapters in books, encyclopedia entries. She's also the associate editor of the five-volume Brill's Encyclopedia of Hinduism. Uh, she was the president of the Society for Hindu Christian Studies, uh, 1996 to 1998, and the founder of Chitra, the Center for the Study of Hindu Traditions in Florida. Uh, she was University of Florida's Teacher Scholar of the Year in 2010. I remember when she was president of the AAR uh, back in 2002 when she gave her address, Embodied Cosmology, Sites of Piety, Sites of Power. It was the only AAR presidential address I can remember where, where there were dancers on the stage, Bharatanatyam, and they somehow <coughs> miraculously folded into her lecture. So it was performative, visual, and the best scholarship all woven together. It was certainly the most memorable presidential address that I can think of. Her books include, um, the books that I um, appreciated very early in terms of my own study of South Indian Hinduism and that she worked uh, very much with John Carmen on, The Way and the Goal, Expressions of Devotion in Early Sri Vaishnava Tradition, The Tamil Veda, which he co-authored with John, Pilan's Interpretation of the Tiruvaimori, the great classic of Vaishnava Tamil spirituality, The Vernacular Veda, Revelation, Recitation, and Ritual, Hinduism, a popular book that's used in many courses, and with Jack Hawley at uh, Columbia, The Life of Hinduism. I can't go through all her articles, but I can't resist picking out a couple just to know what the kind of thing she's done like in the last several years. Who is the strong-armed monkey who churns the ocean of milk? Came out in 2014. 
Social and Bhakti Hierarchies in Interpreting the Life of Tirupan Alvar came out in 2014 also. And also in 2014, Creating Realities, Communicating Dreams, Constructing Temple Lore, Anklets of the Goddess's Feet at the Tirumich Mi Miachur Temple? Miachur Temple. Uh, the Hero at Play, Depictions of the Govardhana Leela Story in Khmer Art, the history of the academic study of religions in universities, centers, and institutions of India. So a widely published scholar, widely appreciated speaker. And I'll end with a, a personal note. The first time we met, we were calculating last night, was probably in the fall of 1979 at the University of Chicago. So although I'm very much older than Vasu, um, I was a beginning doctoral student, and she was already teaching at DePaul University in Chicago. And I believe A.K. Ramanujan and Norman Cutler, the Tamil professors, brought her in for a lecture. And it, for me, it was like this was, I don't know if it's quite the experience of the goddess Sri, but nonetheless, <laughs> this luminous presence in the room of a person who was a top-notch scholar, uh, could speak actually to her audience, engaging us in a very personal way, could with great comfort move back and forth between the written word, the performance, the image, and also spoke without any hesitation or any embarrassment from within her tradition. And for me, that's the ideal of a scholar in any tradition. And that began what is now almost a lifelong friendship between Vasu and me. And I'm delighted that she can be the first speaker in our series. So let us welcome Dr. Vasudha Narayan. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. But first, a very, very happy and auspicious Tamil New Year to all of you. It's our New Year Day today. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and for many other states in India. And may you, your life be filled with auspiciousness and peace. A very special thanks to Mr. Akhilesh Gupta for his exemplary generosity, Kritecha Pratikartavyam Esha Dharma Sanatana. It is by acknowledging a good deed with another good deed that we can really say thank you, and that is the eternal Dharma, Ramayana. It's fitting that Harvard University has named this lecture in honor of Dr. Sarve Parli Radhakrishnan, a philosopher statesman and former president of India. Dr. Radhakrishnan was known for his deep and vast knowledge and his ability to make this wisdom accessible to a wide audience. His translation of the Upanishads were really my guide for many, many years as I was doing my uh, MA and my PhD. On a professional front, therefore, it's a signal honor to give this inaugural talk uh, named after him and after his talks were delivered 90 years ago, May actually. And after he gave those talks in the Upton le Lectures of the Hindu View of Life at Oxford. On a personal note, I would like to acknowledge friendship with Dr. Radhakrishnan's family for over three generations now. In many Indian works, one traditionally begins with a salutation to the guru, and I've had the good fortune of having many good ones. So I'd like to begin by thanking Professor John Carman whom I first met in 1975, and from whom I learned many things Sri Vaishnava. I had the fortune of sharing the latest phase of my Vaishnava research with him and Anne Carmen here last year, or the year before. Professor Carmen introduced, first introduced us to the notions of Paratva and Saulabhya, supremacy and accessibility of Vishnu in the theology of Ramanuja, and reflected on many polarities in several religions in his book, Majesty and Meekness. Like many gurus, he has done most of the work and happy left, happily left just a little bit for his disciple to take care of today. <laughs> but look just a little behind Professor Carmen there. You see Angkor Wat, a temple dedicated to Vishnu built in the 12th century CE. 
Here we find the largest bar relief in the world, 49 meters long. It depicts the story of the churning of the ocean of milk, from which rose many substances, including poison and ambrosia. Hold on to this picture while we consider a poem written in the ninth century by the po poet Namarvar, a poem that Professor Carmen, A.K. Ramanujan, Frank and I actually worked on for a while. Being poverty and wealth, hell and heaven, being enmity and friendship, poison and ambrosia. So he's talking about Vishnu, God, being poison and ambrosia, God being both. Not inside both, not reconciling, he is poison. And he is here in this city, in Vindagar. So sang the ninth century poet Namarvar in Tamil, in praise of Vishnu Narayana. The Tamil word for ambrosia is amudu, and cognate with amrita in Sanskrit, amrita, the ne immortal, the nectar of immortality. The 10 twin words, poison and ambrosia, immediately bring to mind the narrative in which both these substances rose in quick succession. This is the story of how the demons and the divine beings churned the ocean of milk for this elixir, which would make them immortal. To mix metaphors, literally, the holy grail of existence. The narrative found in the epics Ramayana and Mahabharata, as well as in several Puranas, relates how the devas, that's the celestial beings, the gods, and the demons, consummate enemies, came together to churn the ocean of milk in search of the nectar of immortality. The devas, who were being harassed by the asuras, or the demons, by the command of Vishnu, allied themselves with their enemies. There's an important point for many of us. And together, they changed the great ocean of milk to get Amrita, the nectar of immortality. The devas and the demons tied a huge snake, a serpent Vasuki, around the mountain to be the rope and started to pull on e either side. The mountain began to sink to the ground and Vishnu, to save this enterprise, incarnated himself as a giant tortoise. By the way, the light shines on the Kurma Avatara on um, spring equinox, directly on him. Dived into the ocean of milk and held the mount on his back. Vishnu was present in other forms amongst, and I'm quoting the Bhagavata Purana, amongst the gods and the demons, and in another vast body, he sat on the summit of the mountain. With one portion of the, his energy, unseen by gods or demons, he sustained the serpent king. With another, he infused vigor into the gods, and he became one of the asuras to join in this enterprise. Vishnu entered into the asuras in this asuric form. He stimulated the power of the hosts of gods by entering into them in godly form. So with the gods, he became a god. With the asuras, he became an asura. And out of this churning comes a violent poison. Lord Shiva swallowed it to save everyone, and the poison made his neck blue in color, Nila Kanta. And from this came several rewards, Surabi, the wish-fulfilling cow, Parijata, the tree with fragrant flowers, dancing girls, Apsarasas, emblems of royalty, such as an elephant and umbrella, Shri or Lakshmi, the goddess of all good fortune, and Amrita, the nectar of immortality. The gods and the demons share the goodies, but when Sri emer emerges, she is anointed and bathed with the waters of the world and is praised by, Krish by Indra. And this is the picture on uh, the poster. It's Sri emerging from the ocean of milk. The goddess is her own agent. No one can claim her, and she chooses Vishnu as her husband. The story <coughs> continues with Vishnu appearing 
as a woman to distribute the nectar, but the Cambodian uh, depictions don't have that part of the story. The story exemplifies multiple paradoxes, and I'll keep coming back to it several times this evening. And I use the word paradox here initially in a very simple way, as a statement that seems to contradict common sense and yet perhaps is true. People have used paradox in different ways. When we get contradictory answers, even with logical reasoning, or when we appear to get such contradictory answers, or when we observe something that defies common sense, and it's generally in the last uh, sense that physicists use this word. Since Schrodinger's cat, the three pigeons in two holes, and Yoda all thrive <laughs> in a universe of quantum conundrums and paradox, I begin in this very unstable territory. In terms of vastu, this liminal space may or may not be the most propitious for theological construction. In the Vishnu Purana, Vishnu is referred to as the purest of pure spirit, spirits. And yet in the churning story, he's depicted as one who in, in this demonic form, that is Asurena Rupena, he comes and enters the Asuras. Further, he is seen in multiple seemingly binary forms in this narrative, as an Asura and as a Deva in anthropomorphic and animal form, as a male and as a female. And out of the churning comes poison and ambrosia. In many texts, they frame all that comes out of the ocean as the first and the last to emerge. But in the Vishnu Purana, as if to call attention to this paradox, they come immediately after one another. Many things that emerge from the churning, such as dancing girls, apsarasas, enhance the quality of life on this earth. But Sri and Amrita point to a different direction of liberation and from the cycle of life and death. Indra glorifies Sri, saying she is the embodiment of knowledge and devotion, the knowledge of devotion, great knowledge, mystic knowledge, and spiritual knowledge which confers eternal liberation, that's Wilson's translation. Yajna vidya, maha vidya, guhya vidya cha shobane, atma vidya cha devi tvam vimukti phaladhaini. And also as one from whom men obtain wives, children, dwellings, friends, harvests, wealth. Her picture graces lotto ticket sales in India. <laughs> that is, Auspicious blessings in all possible ways flow from God, as Louis Bourgeois says in his paradigmatic doxology. A road map for this evening before we get back to Namarvar and also to the churning story. In my talk today, I'd like to suggest paradox as one way of thinking through multiple layers of Hindu culture. How paradox functions in Vaishnava especially Sri Vaishnava realms, in praise of Vishnu. Specifically, we will explore how we can understand paradox as a primary defining feature of the deity, or at least of the way in which we human beings conceptualize and experience the deity. Studies on the Hindu traditions have focused on institutions, philosophies, and theories which offer organizing principles through which we interpret the materials, the hermeneutics with which we can understand the multiple strands. But although philosophers and theologians have in a sophisticated way teased out the contradictions to present logical, coherent narratives. And some of us in academia further run this through the filters of Weber, Foucault, Derrida, and others to weave these materials into local discourses, I suggest that paradox still remains one very important way 
in which Hindus have historically related to, understood, enjoyed, and lived their traditions. My talk will be in two parts. The first is a longer one, and the second is much shorter. In the first, I focus primarily on Vaishnava, Sri Vaishnava, Tamil, and Sanskrit poetry, and narrative, and art, to show how the deity is praised, that's the doxology part, through the use of paradox, and how paradox is seen in the hymns glorifying Vishnu. And I'll draw primarily from Namarva, the ninth century poet, but also work with three images, three narrative stories in literature and art. These stories are Yashoda, looking into the mouth of baby Krishna and seeing the seven worlds inside his mouth. The second, the sage Markandeya, seeing a baby Krishna in the waters of dissolution, the entire universe has crashed and he has to reboot it again. But meanwhile, the universe is within the stomach of the baby Krishna. And very briefly, if we have time, Akrura's vision of Krishna in the river Yamuna, in the Bhagavata Purana. In these visual scenes, the responses of the witnesses, seen in an exaggerated form in the performing arts, is seen through what we call Adbhuta Rasa, the sense of wonder and even enchantment, enjoyment and engagement with that deity and with life itself. But it goes beyond Adbhuta Rasa. Those who participate in the story and all of us who hear the story are drawn into this wonder, experience what literary connoisseurs call chamatkara. Chamatkara refers to the way in which one enjoys and relishes and tastes the poem or narrative. A caveat, I'm not saying that the, that and the Hindu tradition is the only one which uses paradox or that this is the only way to understand the Hindu tradition. I'm not even going to just list them out. Rather, I focus on the ease, not the tensions, with which these views, which may seem contradictory to others or paradoxical, are simultaneously held by the Hindu. To come back to Namarvar. In his Thiruvai Muri, he speaks of multiple paradoxes. On one level, Vishnu is poverty and wealth, joys and sorrows, poison and ambrosia. On the second, he also says, say he is and he is. His forms are these forms. Say he's not, he doesn't have any form. He's here, not there. He is and he is not. In both states, he pervades and he is without end. And then he says, being virtue and sin, union and separation, and all of these, being memory, being forgetfulness, being existence and non-existence, being none of these, this God. I mean, he's existence, not existence, none of these. And that's what he's really traveling around. He says of Vishnu, being a body of ultimate light, Shudarudam Bhai, and having a body encrusted with filth, Arkupaditodam Bhai. I mean, and that's startling. A statement like that flies against this embodiment of purity, and the 12th century commentator Pillan is quick to point out that the Lord has the filthy words as his body, but he himself has no filth. Let's be very clear about that. The Vishnu Sahasranama the thousand names of Vishnu, which is set right in the Mahabharata, uh, when Bhishma is on the uh, bed of arrows. In that, which is, and it's one of the most popular paintings of praise to Vishnu, in that, in the, in the framing verses, Vishnu is called Pavitranam Pavitramyom Mangalanam Chamangalam, the purest of the pure, most auspicious of the auspicious. And this is the main thrust of Ramanuja's religious philosophy, as is the point of his cousin Pillan. Other binaries in this context have also been discussed. Dr. Venkatachari's book is on God far, God near. 
and Dr. Carmen discusses transcendence and immanence, male and female, good and evil, personal and impersonal in his book, Majesty and Meekness. We can also include others like erotic, ascetic in the Hindu traditions. And in the 20th century, Tagore, a poet par excellence, exulted in paradoxes. Dr. Radha Krishnan quotes him thus, and this is Rabindranath Tagore, in, uh, of Rabindranath Tagore. In the spirit of the Upanishads, Tagore speaks of the Supreme as both superpersonal and personal. Again and again, I send my call to my God, and he has revealed myself both in man and in the formless, in the enjoyment as well as in the renunciation. The spirit of man reveals itself both in personality and the inexpressible. There where man is immortal, Amrita, that's where, that's the sphere I want to live, and that's Tagore. But Dr. Radha Krishnan is quick to note again in the same lectures, this in the lectures that inaugurated the center here, that the harmonizing trend in Indian philosophy, and he speaks about that impo the importance of that and observes that we cannot be content with formlessness, irrationality, uncertainty, and chaos. He could well have been thinking about Pillan, who in the 12th century, in commenting on all these paradoxes listed by Namarva, reconciles them very quickly and says, Vishnu is the antaryaman, the inner controller of all these binaries and transcends all dualities. But Namarvar, he is in the middle of the union here with Vishnu, and for him, Vishnu is existence and non-existence, and it, it's mind-blowing, so to speak, for him. Here, everything in these poems is game for fair questioning. The ultimate binary is existence and non-existence, reminiscent of the Nasadiya Suktam of the Vedas. While Vishnu exists and doesn't exist and is neither, the paradox is that the Arva seems to be sure of one thing, the deity has grace. And in the later verse, Vishnu says, uh, Namarva says, that Vishnu is the three worlds and is not. <laughs> and the very paradox becomes a poem of praise to the deity. Vishnu is the worlds and the negation. But Vishnu also contains the worlds. The entire universe is within him. Peri Arvar, another Arvar, and other poets over centuries have sung about an incident well loved in the Hindu tradition. This is the first of the three stories that I'll briefly talk about to illustrate the enchantment of paradox. Periyarva writes about Yashoda, the foster mother of Krishna. When she opened his mouth to scrape his tiny tongue, she saw the seven worlds inside the child's mouth. And then the simple lady who saw the seven worlds in his mouth said, this isn't a Hermes, this isn't a Herdes, this is the seven worlds in the entire, uh, in dance they show it as all the beings who come out. This isn't a herder's son, he's an amazing god, a god of eminence, of fine quality and character. He is Mayan, the wondrous one. The story Periyarvar talks about is popular with children, with adults, with dancers, and singers of classical Carnatic music. The context differs in many versions, but in many, the kids playing with Krishna laugh with, and say he's eating mud. And Yashoda questions him, show your mouth. And he says, no, not me. <coughs> you got someone else. I didn't eat anything. Mother, I have not eaten dirt. Then friends are all liars. And then Krishna says, open your mouth. The mother says, open your mouth. And then Krishna, and this is the Bhagavata Purana, when Krishna opened his mouth wide by the order of Mother Yashoda, she saw within the mouth all moving and non-moving entities, 
outer space and all directions. Mountains, islands, oceans, surface of the earth, blowing wind, fire, moon, stars, the entire cosmos is inside him. She saw the planetary systems in creation and by transforming the transformation by Ahamkara. And then she sees the mind, the senses, time allotted to every human being, the natural instincts, the reactions of, the, of karma, and all the desires, and so on. And within that, she sees herself looking into Krishna's mouth, looking into Krishna's mouth, and that infinite regression inside that mouth. And so she stops and she says, I'm not married to Nanda. I'm not a mother of this child. I'm not connected with anything in this world. This is, and she, she's not sure. And then she, she, she rubs her eyes and says, is this a dream? Is this an illusory creation or by a wondrous power? And the story, and after this, she looks at, when she looks at herself, she says, my mind is in the world. And she surrenders herself to Krishna completely. And she sings his praises. Because I am not your mother, and she sings his praises here just as a stotra. Therefore, let me surrender unto the Supreme God and offer my worship to him who is beyond the conception of human speculation, the mind, activities, words, and argument, the original cause of this cosmic manifestation by whom the entire cosmos is maintained and by whom we conceive of its existence. Let me simply offer my worship. And that's all she says in the end. And then Yoga Maya takes over and she sees the child as a child again. Two songs are particularly well known in the performing arts. Vyasa Raya, a teacher in the Madhva school of Vedanta in the 15th century, composed one of the most popular and beloved songs in Carnatic music. A whole generation of Hindus from South India in the 20th century were enthralled by the renowned filmmaker Satyajit Ray who did a documentary of Bala Saraswati sing, dancing Krishna ni bega ne baro. Anand? Thank you. And the last line lingers in everyone's heart. This child Krishna, who is miraculously, wondrously ate mud and showed the multiverses inside his mouth to Yashoda, is here in Udupi, in this temple. This person who could not be contained by the cosmos is totally, completely here in this Udupi temple. And that is the par paradox. In Thayi Yashoda, a Tamil song which the Bharatanatyam dancers uh, perform regularly, um, which is, it was composed by Uttakada Subramanyayar in the 17th century, Yashoda says, when she looks at the mouth of Krishna, she says, he is that, it's actually a friend telling Yashoda, he is that God. When I picked him up as a child and put him in my lap to admire his beautiful face, he opened his mouth and showed me the entire universe within it. Here too, the singer and dancer, singing the same refrain over and over again, marveled joyously at the wonders of the many paradoxes. The little child who eats mud shows the entire universe in his mouth. He who is beyond the reach of yogis 
and sages is caught by a woman who spanks him, binds him with the real ropes and the ropes of her love. And this deity, who has many worlds, the universe inside him, is here in Udupi, in this temple. The theme of the child Krishna holding the world inside the cosmos is also <coughs> seen in the second story, which the Arvas and multiple poets all over the world refer to. Often in shorthand as Alile Krishna, he who lies on the banyan leaf. This narrative is portrayed in popular art, painting, jewelry, and so on, and refers to a story in the Mahabharata and several Puranas. The sage Markandeya, who is immortal, never dies, was wandering inside Vishnu, and is thrown out, and perceives the waters of dis dissolution at the end of this cycle of time. And I quote, just then the child inhaled, drawing Markandeya within his body like a mosquito. There the, the sage found the entire universe arrayed inside him as it had been before the dissolution. And he is most astonished and perplexed. That's uh, in the Bhagavad Purana. And inside the child is the entire universe. The skies, the heaven, the earth, the stars, mountain, islands, continents, everything inside him, including agricultural villages, cow pastures, the river by whose side is the hermitage of Markandeya, who is inside that hermitage. <laughs> and that was the, 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 the image itself was curious that it can, combines the Lord's supremacy and accessibility. The, child, the picture of a little child playing on a banyan leaf, floating on the waters of dissolution, and holding the entire universe within is paradoxical, to say the least. It's intensified in later verses, too. And this is Markandeya going around in the waters of annihilation and seeing this personality on the northeast side. And the effulgence was swallowing up the darkness this is a temple ceiling. And Namarva <laughs> looks at him and says, the other day you ate the seven worlds and reclined on a long banyan leaf. Even the divine ones on high don't understand your power. The great Lord holds the star, his strong stomach holds this flood of the seven worlds. Who can transcend a deceptive power and know his innermost self? And then he says, this is strange. Is this why he ate butter now as an antidote? <laughs> he ate all that mud, and that made him sick then? Lord of wonder, long ago you ate the seven worlds and disgorged them by amazing power, and you ent entered them. And then you took a mean body of a lowly human. Even if that mud lingered in your system, from the swallowing of your worlds, was that butter an antidote? Was that a medicine to dissolve the earth or to avoid the pain of being a human? In the Markandeya story, there's a description of the ultimate absorption of the universe into the Lord after the cataclysmic fires and floods suffered by the worlds. There's also specific instances of, Mark, of swallowing Markandeya into him to soothe this agitation. The vision of Markandeya within the Lord is dramatic, everything within him, and then Markandeya self-consciously aware of his being included and contained within the deity. He's outside and he's inside. A nice analogy for those of us who do ethnography and even think contemplative, contemplatively about our own traditions. And it is this liminal space that he praises Vishnu and speaks of him as the Supreme Lord. I'll be very brief in the, with the last story, story only because it's uh, of time, but it's a beautiful one with, with wonderful uh, um, verses in the Bhagavata Purana and beautiful illustrations. Uh, and I owe a lot to Professor Anna Dalla who supplied me with many of these images. Um, here too, 
we get glimpses of alternative reality, alternate realities and wonder. In this story, the elderly Akrura, who's transporting Krishna and Balarama from Gokula to Mathura, leaves them briefly in the chariot and goes to the river Yamuna. Inside the river Yamuna, inside the river, sees the brothers, and every time he goes in to bathe, he sees Vish the baby Krishna, but now transformed into the, the supreme Paravasudeva, which is inside this uh, river. And he's startled, and he says, is this, I left, I just left him in the chariot, let me go back to be sure. He goes back, and they're both sitting on the chariot. So he comes back into the river, he looks again, and there they are again, inside the river. So this goes back and forth, until he's not sure which is reality here. The reaction to all these incidents by the participants within the story and all of us who are drawn into them simultaneously, inside and outside, have is a sense of wonder, of marvel. This is the Adbhuta Rasa, with its attendant expression of surprise and astonishment, vismaya. But it's more than Adbhuta. The word that comes close to it is chamatkara, a word connected with taste and consuming something delicious. David Shulman, who's written a whole article on chamatkara, and he sent this to me a couple of weeks back, he observes within the poetician's discourse, more complete definitions of chamatkara stress the components of pleasurable, physically signaled sense of wonder or amazement. Purely mental effects are somewhat foreign to the tradition. So it's, and quoting Gnoli, he says that chamatkara is an uninterrupted state of immersion. It's an enjoyment characterized by the presence of a sensation of inner fullness. It might be said that chamatkara is an action proper to tasting or enjoying the subject to a person immersed in the inner movement spanda of a magic enjoyment. More precisely, chamatkara is something that continuously floods the learned connoisseurs with delight. Floods is a very liquid um, analogy here. So this was the first and the longer part of my talk which I, on which I focused on the paradox in our perception of the deity and in the stories we tell and our astonishment, our sense of wonder and enjoyment in participating in these stories. In the second part, I opened this up to larger issues. Can paradox be found in other structures in Hindu culture? Depending on how one interprets them, puts them and how one draws the connecting lines in pattern formation, we can see them as paradoxes or as a larger picture with a temporal line of spiritual evolution. You can just see it all as very rational. Let's go back to where we started, the story of the churning of the ocean of milk and all the treasures, the nidhis that came out, and then to the hymns of Namarvar. From the churning came poison, and then several bonbons, the wish-fulfilling tree, the elephant, the dancing girls, you know, Kaustuba, the gem. And then we have Shri and Lakshmi and, uh, and Amrita, which gives immortality. As we note, all the wonderful things and beings that emerge initially seem to enhance our quality of our pleasures, wealth, power, and glory, and sensual enjoyment. Indeed, in some versions, sura, liquor, also emerges. That's wine, women, and song, literally. But amrita is different. It's happiness for keeps. The Brihadaranika has the famous lines that Dr. Radha Krishnan quoted in the opening of uh, the center, mrityurma um, amritam gameya, from death lead me to immortality. Thus, what emerges from the cosmic enterprise is something for everyone. You know, a little bit of wine, a little bit of women, that kind of thing. And then, <laughs> that which gives immortality on the other, the Amrita. And Shri, the goddess of good fortune, holds it all together. 
she gives the power and the glory, so to speak. And she gives everything that we want. And once we get beyond the Adbhuta Rasa and the Chamatkara and the astonishment, what we are left with is a basic paradox. What do we do? We have gone through all of this, <coughs> and now we come to Sri. She gives the power and the glory. She's adored by royalty as the personification of the kingdom, Rajya Lakshmi. And she can give with a grace the power to leave all this aside and to walk away from them to the joy of liberation. Let me illustrate this with a story of Vedanta Deshika, a 13th century theologian. It's said that a young man who wanted to get married came to, the, to Vedanta Deshika, uh, who was a devotee of Vishnu, and asked for monetary help. Deshika wanted to help, but had no money. He therefore, with fervor, composed an ardent prayer to Goddess Lakshmi, Shri Stuti, and asked for her blessings. Pleased with the prayer, Lakshmi fulfilled his wish, and it is said that it began to rain gold coins. It's very similar to the Kanakadara Stotra story. The young man, happy, picked them up respectfully to use them for his wedding. Deshika, on the other hand, <coughs> walked away from the gold and went home to his wife. Yes, he was a married man, and like anyone else, could do with a little extra bit of cash, and that would have been welcome. But he was content, and enough was enough. The young man was happy, Deshika too was happy. So it shows that Sri could give both. Wealth is a blessing as is power and glory and liberation, moksha too, is a laud laudable, um, um, is not just laudable, but from some perspectives, the ultimate goal. And so, as we heard from the famous doxology, it's from God that all blessings flow. We heard Indra, who glorifies Sri, saying she's the embodiment of knowledge of devotion and the spiritual knowledge that gives ultimate liberation. And as one from whom men can get wives, children, dwellings, friends, harvest, wealth, you know, all that. A very popular prayer in Sanskrit, which kind of summarizes all this in very, just very short line, is something that every kid learns. It addresses Lakshmi as, Bhukti Mukti Pradayani. That is, she who grants things to be enjoyed and consumed, as well as liberation from the cycle of life and death. In other words, auspicious blessings in all possible ways flows from God. And we recognize this paradox of the twofold blessings and articulation, of course, of the four Purusharthas, Dharma, Kamartha, and Moksha. What is remarkable is that despite the strong statements about how they're all opposed to each other, most Hindus seem to hold these apparently contradictory aims, these paradoxes, with complete ease. When pushed, one can always justify the paradox as any other paradox with reasonable answers like dharma or higher texts which trump the lower ones and so on. But we hold them easily, naturally, as is seen even in the Palashrutis of Namarvar. And summarizing a larger section here, because it's something that Frank Looney has written about in, the, in one of his many books, um, Namarva speaks about his intense spiritual journey to be one with God. But at the end of every 10 verses comes the Palashruti, the fruit of listening to that, of mastering those 10 verses. And the rewards, as Professor Clooney notes, range, and I quote him, range from the mundane to the end of deeds and births, liberation, or vaikuntha, or belonging to God. So, and he lists all, all these things we get from God, from reciting this. The mundane benefit, and again quoting him, freedom from affliction, abundant learning, good life and prosperity, fame, lordship, ending of troubles, to be like those whom doe-eyed women love. <laughs> Becoming lovers 
becoming lovers of lightning wasted, wasted women. Heavenly pleasures to be fanned by women, life in their own land, and the good name with the wives and children to diffuse the fragrance of jasmine flowers. I like that one. Mm -hmm. To reach the bamboo shoulders of the woman and so on. But the point is this, even in the most spiritual of the hymns, we get this very worldly palashrutis. And these happily flow under the categories of artha and kama. Dr. Radhakrishnan notes in his Hindu view of life that artha takes the note of the economic and the political life of man, the craving for power and property. The urge which gives rise to property is something fundamental, he says, to human nature. Unless we change the very constitution of the human mind, we cannot eradicate the idea of property. For most men, property is the medium for the expression of personality and intercourse with others, as we all know. That becomes our identity. And so, although Shri gives Amrita that which frequently, though not always, keeps one from the path of, to liberation, uh, the path to liberation is the best one. But many multiple theologians and philosophers have noted that, Hindu, hin that human beings hold both spiritual and material desires in tandem, however par par paradoxical it may seem. Um, and the person whom I've quoted at length here, and which I just mentioned briefly, is Parashara Bhattar, a 12th century theologian, who has multiple passages in his commentary on the thousand names of Vishnu. Who speak, and he speaks about the two levels of two kinds of auspiciousness, material and spiritual, which comes from reciting the Vishnu Sahasranama, the thousand names of Vishnu. And he says, and I quote him, you recite it for the purpose of getting rid of inauspicious and distressing troubles caused by poisons, ghosts, diseases, planetary influence, bad dreams, and bad omens. And then you recite these thousand names, he says, for gaining prosperity both here and after and then forgetting the supreme liberation. So one can, depending on one's stance, see these as paradoxical aims, but held so closely together that one may not even think of them as paradoxes. The last part here, the concluding part, I have thus so far suggested that paradox could be one important way of approaching and understanding Vaishnava culture, and possibly other sectarian traditions as well. At first glance, it may seem that the appeal of paradox and the intellectual satisfaction of coherence can be attributed to the potential functions of different kinds of literature. We see and enjoy paradox in poetry and narrative to some extent, and then we leave the logic supposedly to philosophy. Such a natural divide seems almost self-evident, and the Sri Vaishnava community has also recognized it in some fashion. The ritual formulaic verse praising Vedanta Deshika, the prodigious writer and theologian from the 13th century, 750 years coming up now, says that he is the lion among poets, and logicians, Kavitar Kikasimha, Kavitar Kikakeshari. The commentators say that Ramanuja brings order to the way in which Vedic passages are understood. He untangles the hairs, an unruly hair of a woman. He combs them out neatly, puts perfumed oil, and puts them tidy order. And the analogy is like a maidservant untangling and bringing to order the queen's tresses. Ramanuja is the handmaiden of Shruti, Vedas, because it's the beloved of Vishnu. And this order is celebrated. And Dr. Radha Krishnan, in an inimitable Hindu view of life, focuses on this harmony and order. 
commenting, in fact, on Hindu society as a whole, that he says that the society stands for the ordered complexity, the harmonized multiplicity, the many in one, which is the clue to the structure of the universe. And it's there. It's all there. But there's also chaos and also paradox. And a happy, pleasurable attitude in contemplating some of these instances. Despite all the organizing principles that philosophers in our narratives have, we still live in this liminal state of paradox, praying for moksha, but really wanting all the good stuff and this worldly <laughs> prosperity. But is philosophy devoid of paradox? In talking about this informally, my colleague, Professor Jonathan Edelman, who's here from University of Florida, says, and I quote him, the central theological doctrine of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition is achintya bheda abheda tattva, or the truth of the paradoxical difference and non-difference. This is meant to demonstrate that Sri Krishna is both the same and different from his shaktis or powers, consisting in the individual souls or jivas and the emanated world prakriti. The difference and non-difference, he says, is paradoxical, achintya, because the two opposite truths, and here comes the philosophical part, are reconciled in a single conscious non-dual reality. A paradoxical reality that is beyond ordinary thinking and yet knowable. And we've had time to see this kind of relationship to get today. While the philosopher has reconciled the differences and Jiva Goswami, whom Jonathan quotes in this longer passage, is quite the philosopher, the wonder, the achintya, the paradox, still preserves. As I end this talk, I'd like to move beyond the idea of enjoyment and reveling in paradox suggested by Chamatkara. I'd like to suggest that this area of paradox, perhaps, has offered a liminal space for Hindus to constructively engage with our traditions to choose and emphasize some aspects while holding on to the multiple parts. When it comes to conjunctions, we Hindus have in general preferred and to or. <laughs> while it is possible to cite instances of such paradox which have moved different traditions to action, I'll focus on one. The stories of Yashoda looking into Krishna's mouth of Markandeya swimming in the waters of dissolution makes us conscious of mind-boggling notions of space and time and our own place in the universe. <laughs> Poets and philosophers emphasize the importance of, an individ of the individuals. They don't say you're just a speck here. It's you, it's all about you. And your reactions, your senses, your feelings, your emotions, after all, the traditional Sanskrit blessing in any occasion is shatamanam bhavati, shatayu purusha, shatendriya, ayushyendra pratitishtati. May you live for a hundred years with a hundred sense organs intact, established in you and strong, and enjoy life in a hundred different ways. That's hardly life in negating. <laughs> the stories of Yashoda and Markandeya puts it all in different perspective. It's all about location, location, location. <laughs> <laughs> and zooming in and zooming out, we get multiple perspectives of a situation of being both a subject and an object. Yashoda is outside, looking into Krishna's mouth, at herself looking into Krishna's mouth in an infinite regression, progression. Markandeya sees the entire universe within the baby lying in the waters of dissolution, and then seems to go through this wormhole into an alternate reality and is gazing at himself, looking at the universe which contains him. The different visions, the different darshanas, enable us, empower us to have the flexibility to think through multiple issues, literally think outside the mouth or the body of God. Our problems and egos are important, but the vision that Markandeya had can put them in perspective, 
just as the encountering of the images sent by the Hubble or a look at where we are in a stupendously large universe is so humbling. But this enormity does not, ought not, paralyze us into act, acting, and we go back to the Bhagavad Gita here. Just as Yashoda quickly slides back into the role of the mother, and Arjuna gets back into being the uh, warrior even after the Vishwarupa Darshana, our paths of actions are also cut out. And our position, it's hoped, can give us the space and perspective to see other viewpoints. And depending on where one is, one can see Vishnu in the churning scene in a godly form or with asuric power as a turtle in an anthropomorphic form, a man or a woman. Seeing Vishnu as a baby who is to be disciplined, who can be tied up, makes him a personal deity one can question and one can challenge. There's a whole genre of songs called Ninda Stuti in which devotees decry God or show their displeasure, all the while knowing paradoxically that he is supreme. Songs of such chiding are still composed. One a few years ago, composed by Sujata Vijay Raghavan, introduced the idea of environmental pollution and compared it to the idea of poison released by the snake in the churning of the ocean of milk. And she sings to, uh, uh, Shiva, and it's called Nila Kantare Varumaya. Come on, you blue throated one. You swallow the poison, and and the poison is only in your throat. Are you? A, look at the poison we've strewn around the world, the entire universe. We have polluted this world plenty. Come here. Are you afraid to suck up this poison? Are you afraid that your whole body will become blue like Vishnu? And that's a beautiful song that Sujata Vijayaragvan composed, and, and it, it was danced. And again, the idea of introducing dance into our thinking, into our, our contemplative theology, really comes to a great deal in my, my life through the work of Frederic, who's here today, Frederic Marglan, who was one of the first people I knew to introduce dance as a way of understanding Hindu culture. And so, like bifocal glasses, we hold multiple visions simultaneously, moving from one to another seamlessly. We see our place in the universe and then see ourselves right in the center. We desire the money, the wealth, and the power, and we want the spirituality. In holding these views that seem different, we find the space for dharma, our space to consider multiple viewpoints to clean the environment and not dig your heels in. By having paradoxes, by holding different, sometimes binary views, it is also possible to valorize what may really be important. I end with a verse of Tukaram, felicitously referring to the story with which we began. Felicitously, a verse that Dr. Radhakrishnan quotes in his Hindu view of life. Tukka tells God that we fell into sin is thy good fortune. We have bestowed name and form on thee. Had it not been for we, who would have asked about thee when thou was lonely and unembodied? It's darkness that makes the light shine, the setting that gives luster to the gem. And here, referring to the story of the churning, he says, disease brought light, brought to light Dhanvantri, the god of medicine. Why should a healthy man wish to know him? It's poison that confers value on nectar. Tukha says, it's because of me, God, that you exist. And paradoxically, I'm here because we are in the business of creating order. And I'm offering paradox as one alternative way of classification and enjoying the Vaishnava traditions. Thank you.
I'd like your permission to share one last quote with you. It was one that gave me a, a real thrill. Um, it, rec it kind of illustrated chamatkara for me. Recognize that the very molecules that make up your body, the atoms that construct the molecules, are traceable to the crucibles that were once in the centers of high mass stars. They exploded their chemically rich guts into the galaxy, enriching pristine gas clouds with the chemistry of life. And it's Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> so we're all connected to each other biologically, to the Earth chemically, and to the rest of the universe atomically. That's kind of cool. <laughs> it makes me smile, and I actually feel large at the end of that. It's not that we are better than the universe. We are part of the universe. We're in the universe, and the universe is in us. It's kind of like Yashoda, Markandeya, the whole gang. <laughs> Thank you. So we, we take this as kind of a celebratory occasion tonight, a chance to um, talk with one another informally. But would you mind taking a few questions or comments before we go? So who would like to? There's one over there, the first, David. Yeah, so I was very, very happy that, you know, looking at this issue of paradox that you kind of talked about the, the interaction between the theologians and the poets and kind of came down much on the side of the poets, if I... Just for today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as much as I love Jiva Goswami, I'm much partial to his uncle, Rupa Goswami, and he's still... Uh, Jiva, do I understand, is a poet? Is yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, it... it Looking at a lot of this kind of the, the Stothra literature, what you find is that in rather than trying to kind of parse your way through paradoxes, there's a way in which through language itself, there's a kind of reveling in paradox. I mean, in the most pr profound way through Shlesha, but... but you know. Yes, most definitely. And, and so I'm wondering, I mean, this is my own familiarity is largely with Sanskrit Stothras, and so I'm wondering... And at one point you made reference, I think it was to a poem of Namalavas that, that, you know, the commentary upon it that tried to work through the... Um, the and more on that, it was a conference book. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if, if you see the same kind of, kind of reveling in language and playing with language as a way to kind of, you know, kind of present paradox without dealing with it, mm -hmm. in, in a way. Um, in, yeah. in this kind of... In Absolutely. I, in fact, I, I left out that entire section. I didn't get into it. Um, but David Shulman has. And he comes up with, me, and he and Egal Bronner have written much about the Shlesha and, and, and the enjoyment and the, the, uh, just dealing with it right there in its own self, so to speak. Yep, you're absolutely correct. And, and people have recognized it. And, and, is that, and is that there in the Tamil literature? in the same way that, you know, it's kind of explicitly talked about in Sanskrit. Not to the best of my knowledge, but I could be wrong. No, it, it's not that obvious to me in the Tamil literature. Uh, not in these bhakti poems, anyway. It could be in others. I'm trying to remember the Tanjo poems in which you can read it all as uh, the exploits of Vishnu on the one hand, and the other way about the exploits of the king. Uh, you know the ones, 17th, 18th century. But I think that's Sanskrit. Sanskrit. You do have it in, um, you have visual punning. Yes, yeah. And then the one that which I didn't get into because I didn't understand it really, <laughs> um, is there is apparently music and par par paradox in music also. And I have, uh, Anyway, I, someone, my, my brother-in-law wrote the long thing explaining to me and then gave up at one point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like pearls before me, so. Thank you for that. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Um, in the tradition that you're uh, explaining, is the idea of the use of paradox that ordinary thinking has to be transcended. So I'm thinking, is there an analog to something in, say, the Zen or the Chan tradition, or even the Madhyamaka tradition, where ordinary thinking has to be sort of smashed or cracked 
by me, and one way to do that is with paradoxes, including the, the, the sharpest kind of paradoxes, which philosophers call this of antilogy paradoxes, like this sentence is false. I mean, you show you, you, a path to liberation requires overcoming ordinary thinking, and that's a role of paradox. Is that a, a way that you... No, not to the best right? of my knowledge, Frank. You wouldn't, I know. We really come down in terms of everything firmly on the side of the philosopher, which is why I was kind of like... But what does it mean on the side of... Well, it's more fixed in terms of the path. This is really bhakti or prapati, and there are clear ways of doing it. It's not so much as the... It's not short-circuiting your brain, so to speak, with those koans. That's so it's a mild kind of paradox. Yeah. So but that you can explain away. Yeah. The, this, yeah, which they have explained away, but we still, and that's my argument, we're still responding to it on a different level. Um, and there are stories occasionally of how people have responded with wonder to a story and you know, reached the Supreme Court. Could I pick up on that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> you don't think that there's a, <coughs> excuse me, a certain sense in which these, this invoking of this abhutarasa is, is meant to sort of push the devotee into a different or, oh, way of thinking and a way maybe now, I don't know as much about yes, the but um, and then they go back to their duty, they go back to their life. And they but go back the to the yoga sense, maya. Yeah, but, but that was what I was thinking, but is it, I, 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 maybe I misunderstood the question I was wondering, is that explicitly written about or is that recognized? I think we recognize it, and that's good enough. But I, I think you are right that the, in the Adbhuta Rasa, there is a way in which you can transcend and get there. But it's not quite the koan, I would think. Not espousing the way of paradox. Thank you for a, a talk that induced the Rasa of Chamatkar. <laughs> Thank and you. on the matter of paradox, I think it is the rasa of paradox one has to get. Paradox yeah. as a rasa. Yeah. And or that rasa, I would uh, suggest, is to be able to hold those two views in a higher conciliatory mm -hmm. unity view of non-duality. All paradox is only ultimately resolved at that level. Paradoxically enough. <laughs> there has to be a resolution, but it is always a higher ground for resolution. And thank you for stepping in. Thank, 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 you. thank you for this very beautiful lecture on paradox, and it strikes me that one of the um, one of the features of the poetry that you showed was a degree of humility with respect to truth. Um, and not just the holding of multiple things in tension or the embracing of those, but actually a degree of sort of um, stepping back. And so do you think that that worldview that's, has something to say to our present sort of situation? I think situation? that's what I was trying to get at, actually. It's not just the multiple world, but the humility that one gets and, and the stepping back. And yeah, I think that that's the very important part. And you express it so much better than I did here. That's exactly what I was trying to get to. I'm wondering if you have, you think that it has something to say to, especially a current situation of the politics of religion and the study of religion, where from multiple sides there's a. I thought you were just saying talking about American politics. <laughs> <laughs> especially American politics, but the study hey, of religion. We've been talking about philosopher statesmen today, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, I, absolutely, I think so. I think it's something that all of us can, ought to have in mind. Nearly? Yeah, I was, uh, you referred to subjectivity and objectivity in the later part of your talk. And I was fascinated by that uh, because uh, in the narratives that we, uh, you presented and you discussed, the um, human devotee or observer is observing this uh, mystery of the divine and in the paradoxical uh, vision that they get. Uh, and I was just wondering, this, 
the sub, on the subjective side of the devotee, uh, is there anything uh, that you would comment on about how the human divine relation can also be is also presented as paradoxical? In uh, absolutely, in, yeah. In because I ask this because in Nursi Mehta, the poetry to my word is uh, there is always a tension between how the devotee is in love with the divine and. But then the devotee also has the power to, to and I, I mean, so. bind yes. all this complexity yeah. with just a fiber of love. That's what he says in his poems, you have all these paradoxes. And then he says, he's this and that. He's not this and he's not that. He's all this and yet. So how do I understand this? But the only thing I know is that a saint can bind him with the, the fiber of love. The saint can bind him with the power fiber. of love. Fiber As of love. love the yes. fiber of love. That's beautiful. You've answered that question there. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part of it is what Tuka says in the end. It's my words, really, because of my words that you exist out here yeah. in a certain way. <laughs> it reminds me, um, I think it was a ninth century inscription in, uh, not sure, ninth or tenth. Uh, the person who's carving the inscription writes and tells about the king, you could give all these big donations, you could conquer all these lands, but you exist, you will be known to posterity only if I carve your, <laughs> <laughs> all your wonderful deeds out here. You could do anything you want and you're nothing without your PR agent. <laughs> I am carving this and he said without this, it's like dancing in the dark. And that's what in a sense, we, but there's pleasure in dancing in the dark. And there is that too which we should understand. And it, you know, every thought doesn't have to be published. <laughs> I'm sorry, there was a question from the back. <laughs> well, thank you very much for making us aware, or at least make me aware, that life itself is paradoxical. We don't see anything that is permanent and absolute. That is more of a myth, more of a social construction, more of the desire for eternity. But in fact, life and everything that exists is paradoxical. What do you think? <laughs> Life is paradoxical, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I absolutely agree. I think that's... <coughs> Would you elaborate on that? Because... I don't reconcile it. I wish I could. Uh, but no, I'm still swimming. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely correct. Thank you. Well, I was just... Uh, you reminded me of something that Bill Hanna says. He says that um, Ram was nobody without Ram. Ah, and, and yeah. So it's just an association for I guess. And another, I mean, Tiru Marisai Ram at that verse, where he prays to the Lord, without you I am not, without me you are not. Mm -hmm. And the commentators soften it in terms of, oh, yeah. of creation and so on like that, but it, the paradox of it is, that this is an intense mutual relationship in which one can neither imagine God nor the devotee without one another. It's a very stark little verse. Yeah. In Narsimhita also there is one, you are because I am, yeah. Yeah. without me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wonder whether we are somehow separating two distinctly different experiences now. You know, on the one hand, all primordial religious experiences are paradoxical, living with it. But it's a second order of reality to theology. You know, theology is always a second, third order of reality, abstract, 
one step removed. We're in business to right. do that. Exactly. <laughs> Are we exactly? <laughs> and therefore, if they, we read that into the presentation that you gave, for example, uh, there are two different levels of work is done. Uh, all all our poems, at one primordial, immediate level of experience, the paradox, one can revel in paradox, including Fukar on the reading that you gave. And then there are others like Tulan and others when they begin to theologize, mm -hmm. systematize. They move in a different intellectual enterprise altogether. I mean, within the Christian tradition, for example, John of the Cross, uh, Hildegard, and uh, even the many of the mystics, including uh, Meister Eckhart, and so on, uh, that's one level of living uh, the life of faith, love. The other order of the other, as, as, a, as a theologian, and I, but, I can move um, on to another level. Uh, I, I, yes, I mean, I think we, we would agree with that. But I'm, what I'm suggesting is that this sense of adbhutarasa and astonishment is for not just for the alvar. It's here for when oh, sure. we participate. I meant them only as an mm -hmm. archetypal experience yeah. of all, sure. But the adbhutarasa is uh, a level for all, but we don't necessarily have to immediately say, now how this is resolved. No. The desire to resolve is I mean, another I, I order. I don't think, and yeah. that's the point of what I was trying to say, we, we, we're not in any hurry to resolve any of this. Right, right. We're so just perfectly of, happy doing this stuff, exactly. keeping the it together. Yeah. The question of asking whether these two are resolved in a greater one is a very different order of yeah. mental exercise. Yeah. Yes. And we probably should not confuse yeah. these two. Because I do remember in, 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 in a class in teaching and something in Christian doctrine, uh, suddenly somebody puts up, but where is the truth in all of this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, I mean, like anything I've said is the essential thing. Frederick? Vasudev, thank you, first of all, for an absolutely gorgeous, fulfilling thank you. Uh, presentation. It's, it's my great fortune to be able to be here. But what I wanted to particularly uh, praise you is precisely to keep the two and not seek that resolution. Keep the two, because this is keeping the two just in the way you, you, you've shown in the performing arts, which is wonderful, wonderful of course, that uh, diversity and openness, it fosters uh, diversity in the natural world, in the social world, and uh, it's, a, it's a key message uh, because normally in the especially northern countries uh, we tend to have the either or as you said not both and um, and and we are uh, destroying diversity at all levels yeah. uh, biological mm -hmm. uh, linguistic cultural remainments. Many parts of our world. That and then, was the underlying message, unfortunately. You know, conflicts yeah. between religions yeah. and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, your whole presentation is like a beautiful performance to bring us to that place. And Thank I think you. Thank you so much for your kindness. Mm -hmm. well, that might be a wonderful um, final tribute. Um, if I could add just one thought, I mean, I loved your title from the first time you told me it. It was paradoxology. Right. It's paradox, but it's doxology. Right. Right. And, and the fact that you, you, you're not stymied in an academic context by, you come to a point where you can't say anything more, but doxology is praise. Mm -hmm. And there may be theologies that follow from that, but the fact that the paradox still enables you for this love relationship and the mm -hmm. praise that follows. And the title so beautifully catches that together, um, and then everything just expands from the title, which is beautiful. So thank you so much for. Thank you.